Welcome to my top 10 games of the decade. For the past month, I've been listing my top 100 games and now it's finally time for the top 10. Let's establish some ground rules. This is my list, my personal 10 picked games of the decade. And I'm very sorry, I haven't played absolutely every game as much as I wanted to find time to play some of them. If a game you love isn't on the list, it's probably somewhere in the top 100 if I've played it. And if it's not as high as you'd like it to be, well, as I said, it's my list. I'd love to know what's on your list. If you enjoyed a set of games more than me, that's awesome. I'm glad you love them. Also, Minecraft was actually released as early access on the 17th of May 2009, despite the Wikipedia page stating 18th of November 2011. So this will not be on the list. With all that said and done, let's begin, shall we? I think this top 10 listing is going to highlight just how great games have been these past few years. Eight of them are from the last three years. But first, we go back to 2015 with Undertale. Undertale is one of the biggest indie games of all time. Almost single-handedly worked on by Toby Fox, this game is designed to take your expectations of a game and tear them to shreds. I think it's not spoiling anything by talking about the main mechanics of the game. Everyone knows by now it's a turn-based RPG where you have choices when you fight. You can of course choose to kill enemies, or you can spare them. There's a genocide route, a pacifist route, and a neutral route. Everyone I see who praises the game tells people to do pacifist and then genocide. I'm going to tell you something different. Play neutral first. Kill some and spare others. I won't spoil why, but there's something that happens that is completely lost if you go pacifist. And I think it's one of the biggest twists in gaming history. I'm honestly surprised more people don't speak as highly of that moment. Yes, that will mean you need to do free playthroughs, but this game isn't that long and it is wickedly funny and more importantly, fun. Every single character interaction is unique and it goes above and beyond to make you laugh and it all changes depending on how you play. Maybe it just caters to my style of humour really well, but I don't think it misses a beat. Speaking of beat, Undertale beat Ocarina of Time in a poll for the best game of all time in its debut year on Game FAQs, and everyone got pissy about it. But yeah, it's deserved. Ocarina of Time is a wonderful game, and groundbreaking for the time, but so is Undertale in a different way. It's made its mark by changing the conventions in the best way possible, and creating a story and a cast of characters that are lovable and you will get beyond attached to. Also, the genocide route will mess you up. Oh, and Undertale's in Smash Bros Ultimate now. SANS! <laughs> what a world we live in. No question, this is the best Platinum Games game out there. Nier Automata is one of the most captivating, most beautiful experiences in gaming history. From its gorgeous visuals and style, to its spellbinding music, its superbly enticing story, and its distinct Platinum Games gameplay, this game truly has it all. I'm going to make sure I won't spoil a single thing that's important, but here's the story. It's the future. There was a massive war and humans have been sent to colonise on the moon until it's safe. Down on Earth, machines reign, and androids working for humans must destroy them all so Earth can be safe once more. This game went in directions I wasn't expecting, and it will emotionally cripple you at times, and you're not going to really be able to prepare yourself for it. I don't know what it is I love most about the gameplay. Is it the slick, fast-paced, perfect combat that can be altered in many ways by the weapons you equip and the perks you shift around? Is it the perfect boss fights that keep you hooked for every single second? Is it the bullet hell styled flight missions? Is it all of those things? It might be all of those things and more. This game is just perfection. I've played through it a few times, much like everything else in this list, and I don't think it's enough. There are so many twists and turns that have so much importance and never lose their weight on a repeat playthrough. It's an experience you should treat yourself to. It is something truly special. After many hit or miss games and nearly a decade of the occasional mobile racing game, Crash Bandicoot is back! Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy kicked off a trend of remasters, and I am all for this. This is Crash Bandicoot 1, 2, and Warped, but remade from the ground up to have better graphics, improvements to the games here and there, and each game now has time trials. I'm still not 
fully sure why they're remasters, because they are definitely remade. Remaster implies it's like an upscaled port, where this is a different development team completely starting from scratch, but yeah, whatever. I love this game. I'm a massive fan of the original Crash Trilogy because of their fantastic platforming, their ferocious difficulty, their charm, and their nostalgic value for me. Crash Bandicoot 2 was the first game that was actually mine, and I can replay it over and over and over again. And that's what they do with this trilogy. They've changed it so that every level from Crash 1, 2 and 3 have time trials instead of just 3. And getting the Platinum Relic in each level is no joke, but going for all of them was so fun and satisfying. There are even two brand new levels within the game. One is Stormy Ascent, aka the hardest 2D platforming level in the series. It was cut from the original game because it was quote unquote too hard, and they were not wrong. This level will tear your sanity to shreds if you're not prepared, but to be fair, quite frankly, nothing will prepare you. And then you have Future Tense, a brand new level created by Vicarious Visions, and honestly, it's one of my favourite levels in the entire series. They took the assets of the future levels and created something unique with it, and I personally can't wait to see what they do with Crash next. If this is what they can do with one level, I want to see what they can do with a full game with their own ideas. Who knows, it might become my new favourite. Persona 4 holds a special place in my heart. That game helped me get out of a rough depressive slump I had been in for months, and Golden is just a greatly enhanced version of this spectacular game. Persona 4 Golden is a turn-based RPG that has you live out a year in the game, as you uncover a murder mystery by going into a TV world where you have to face the worst parts of yourself. It's all about reaching out to the truth, the truth behind the murders, and the truth within yourself. Also, Junez is a thing. Also part 2, Nanako is the most precious person ever and I would die for her. It's incredibly difficult to write for a cast of characters, but with that persona magic, they somehow manage to come up with over 20 characters, and you end up loving every single one of them, the good and the bad. You will also absolutely relate to at least one of them. So why does Persona stand out, besides the excellent writing, characters and story? Well, as I mentioned, the game has you live out a year in high school, and you might be thinking you don't want to go back to school, and yeah, school sucked, but this is a little different. Whilst you do exams and answer mini questions, which I actually found a lot of fun, maybe I have a problem, you can also boost stats by doing different things, like reading and doing jobs and much more. You also form bonds with your friends and family by taking part in social sessions called social links. You hang out with a friend, and once that's done, you get close to them and learn more about them, and it's the most interesting and heartwarming part of this game. Plus, you also get perks for maxing out a social link, so it's definitely worth it. But of course, it's more than just a visual novel. It's a badass turn-based RPG with an epic soundtrack, multiple dungeons to explore, supremely cool bosses to fight, and game overs to witness. Oh, didn't I mention? This game can be super hard at times. Thankfully, the golden version is a lot more lenient with how much progress you lose. In the original, you could lose 3 hours in a dungeon by having the audacity to make a mistake. But now, it's got lovely little continue points. Unless you're on the hardest difficulty, then you can suffer. Which, you know, is pretty fair, I chose my fate. The golden version of the game adds brand new dungeons, story sequences, attacks, characters, bosses, and an epilogue that made me giddy the entire way through. Any game in the Persona series is an experience, and one I strongly encourage you to try. It's just a shame Golden is only on the Vita, and no one owns the damn thing. Please port it to the PS4, Atlas. <music> Hollow Knight is the best Metroidvania ever made. That's right, I said it. Hollow Knight is a 2D action-adventure platformer Souls Metroidvania all rolled up into one, and I don't think there's any aspect of the game that fails. It's hard to describe the absolute beauty of this world, the intrigue, the intricacies, but it's all perfect. For all its greatness of the Metroid series, I find that things like missile upgrades are just placed, perhaps pointlessly so. With Hollow Knight everything, from the incredible creatures to the horde of collectibles, feels like it's bedded in the world. Nothing is just placed. There's a sense of purpose. And every single location is so radically different from each other, that everything genuinely feels fresh and exciting. Or absolutely terrifying if you have a fear of spiders, or 
bees, or, well, I won't tell you what, why, or when, but something in the game triggers after a certain event, and oh man, you're not prepared for it. The difficulty will ramp up, but you'll feel like you've earned it. When the game launched, it had over 30 bosses, and, well, that's still true, but you can add a lot more to that list. As Team Cherry, the developers we don't deserve, gave us free DLC expansions for free, and each adds so much to the game, one of which is an insane boss rush mode, and I absolutely adore this. Team Cherry really know what we like, and they work so hard to make the best game possible. The game is certainly not for those who are looking for an easy ride, because it's not going to give you one, but the game is so easy to play and pick up, even if it's been a while since you've played, it's like you never left. There's also a ton of diversity in the different charms the game offers to find the perfect playstyle for you. They've really made this game accessible for anyone willing to take on this epic challenge. Team Cherry has even gone one further. They were going to make DLC to play as Hornet, but instead it's a brand new game seemingly larger than this already massive game. Thank you so much, we don't deserve you. I once stated Super Mario Odyssey was better than a hat in time, even before all the improvements and the mods. I was so wrong. A Hat in Time is one of the best platformers of all time. Of all A Hat in Time, ugh, end me. It feels so free. You have such delicate, precise movement. Dare I say, one of the best controlling games of all time. This game was bred for speedrunning, so the movement is totally under your control, and you can do a couple easy tricks to boost your speed even more. There's also a little hop to completely stop your momentum in a way that's not jarring, and is really easy to ensure you land where you want. It's perfect. A Hat in Time thrives by having incredibly unique ideas in its levels, from a murder mystery on a train, to a genuinely on-edge horror level in a haunted house, to a super fun platforming gauntlet, and let's not forget the DLC that's a literal cat Yakuza underworld train station. That is genius. With bosses which are on par with the greatest from other 3D platformer classics, they're fun, chaotic, fast, and definitely intense. Also, there's mod support that adds a lot of cool customization to the gameplay, but some truly epic custom levels too. This game is now seemingly endless due to this, and I could not be happier. My purple boy is back! Spyro Reignited Trilogy is everything that is pure in this world. The three Spyro games on the PS1 are beautiful, and Reignited Trilogy takes them, remakes them, and it is just a wonderful experience. This is what I wanted, my favourite games back into the spotlight with room for sequels, and it looks like that's what we'll probably be getting. Spyro Reignited Trilogy is absolutely beautiful looking. The games have always looked pretty and unique on the PS1, but how they look here is staggering. It plays almost identically to the original games, but the other characters actually control a lot better than they did originally, which is a blessing. Yes, you've lost some of the cool glitches like the double jump in Spyro 2, but that's not a problem. We all knew that was going to happen, and I certainly won't complain. This game just makes me so happy, and truthfully, if a game can succeed in making you feel that way, you know what, that's all you need. I have put over 500 hours into Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled. Please help me! Crash Team Racing was my favourite kart racer, but this game is that, but better. It looks better, feels better to control, has Nitro Kart tracks, has brand new original tracks too, as well as over 40 characters and brand new free Grand Prix events with new tracks and characters lined up each month, seemingly until next May at least. This game certainly has its issues online here and there, and it's been glitchy along the road outside of that too. <laughs> oh my dear Christ, what is that? But I bloody love this game. It is very much a highly skilled kart racer if you want to compete online, but I welcome anyone to give it a try, because every session I play online is an experience. Not always a great one, but one I keep coming back to because it's just so fun. Maybe I'm conditioned to come back, but I enjoy the thrill of getting rammed up the arse to a halt and then clawing my way to come first. Also, racing in this game is pretty fun too. Kingdom Hearts 1.5 plus 2.5 on the PS4 is the best way to play Kingdom Hearts. Fact. This is one hell of a game. 
Not only does it have Kingdom Hearts 1, Chain of Memories 2, Birth by Sleep, and the 358 over 2 days and coded movies, oh boy, that's a mouthful, but they run in 60 frames per second now, look even better than ever, and have orchestrated soundtracks. Oh, and the loading screens are ridiculously quick. PS3 lasted like 10 to 15 seconds per loading screen. Now it's 1 to 3 seconds at most. It's incredible. I have put over 500 hours into this collection doing absolutely everything there is to do in all the games. And let me tell you, some of the stuff this game demands for a Platinum Trophy is tough. And in some ways unreasonable, especially in Chain of Memories and Birth by Sleep, forcing you to complete all three stories to 100%. All missions, mini-games, secret bosses, synthesis, all of it three times. That's just harsh, but boy it feels good when you succeed. I know I said no HD collections, but as I've listed, it contains a lot more than just a port. Also, Birth by Sleep was released in 2010, so it totally counts. If you've never tried the Kingdom Hearts series, there's never been a better time with all the games on the PS4 in a package deal or in separate collections, and Kingdom Hearts 3's DLC is going to bump that game up into god-tier territory in no time. So everyone, ride that hype train! But, now we're here. After all the games we've experienced, all the memories gained. The over 20,000 words I've written, oh Jesus Christ, my brain is crying. It's time to move on to my favourite game of the decade. Here we go. Persona 5. Persona bloody 5. Persona 5 Royal came out in Japan in October, but I have a rule that I'm not including Japan exclusive releases as it alienates the majority of my audience. But that doesn't matter because Persona 5 is still my game of the decade. Persona 5 Royal will be extremely high on the list in the next decade because this game is basically reaching levels of perfection and Royal is just so much better than the current perfection in every way. How did they even do that? Persona 5 has become the new standard for RPGs. It does so much that others wouldn't dare think of and succeeds at all of them. I've spent over, I think, 700 hours playing this game over 6 playthroughs, not including Royal, and I've loved every single second of it. Like the previous games in the series, the characters are so lovable, even the villains. You relate to them, bond with them, and I just love how Atlas has managed to yet again create a cast of characters who are entirely different from all the rest that's come before them. Sure, they'll share one or two personality traits as a previous character, but they're definitely their own person, and you'll have fun discovering more about them. The dungeons in this game are not like Persona 3 or 4. Every dungeon is not a randomly generated flat floor. It has a sense of purpose. Think of an 8th floor dungeon from Persona 4, times the size of it by 3 to 6, and this is your dungeon. It's huge, and every dungeon feels completely different as you traverse through a lot of enemies, and extremely fun puzzles, and some damn fine satisfying platforming too. As you'd expect, the social links are back, but this time renamed as Confidence. You really get attached to every character you befriend for completely different reasons, and that'll be due to just how good the writing is. The entire game is filled with interesting real dialogue and funny one-liners and all of it combined just makes it a feel-good time. Oh, and the music! My god! Persona 5 is such feel-good epic music that you just want to listen to anywhere. I still listen to it on a regular basis. And finally, the gameplay. What a step up from Persona 4, not to discredit Persona 4 in any way. That game is incredible, this game is just better. I don't think I've seen a better implementation of turn-based combat in a game before. In fact, Persona 5 has mastered the art of convenience. Every action is mapped to a button on the controller in a very easy to understand way. Even outside of the combat, they've made it convenient as you can save anywhere, with the exception of dungeons bar a few save rooms. You mess up a confidant? Just save beforehand and load it. Simple. Every enemy and character will have different strengths and weaknesses. Once you learn the weakness, your battle becomes much simpler. You have multiple ways to attack, whether it be a standard physical attack, or magic, or even the gun. You don't get many bullets, so use it sparingly per venture into the dungeon, which Royal does actually fix as it refreshes after every fight, but you have less bullets as a compromise. But your whole party has bullets, so you shouldn't run out too soon. If you weaken an enemy, you get to attack another enemy, or if you yourself don't have the weakness, you can switch to another party member without wasting a turn and getting a nice stat increase in the process to deal the final blow you need. Once all enemies are down due to finding their weakness, you can do an all-out attack which will usually kill all the enemies unless it's a boss or you're seriously underleveled. 
There are also interrogations where once an enemy is weakened, you can interrogate it, giving you various rewards. Depending on your response, you can get items, money, or they'll even join you as a persona. What a beautiful mechanic, and what a beautiful game! I mean, look at it! It's one of the most stylish looking games I've ever seen, and never gets boring to look at. Persona 5 paves the way for companies to see what's possible in narrative design and gameplay, and if we're lucky, we'll see something else come along which truly blows us away in the same way that this game does. Well, apart from Persona 5 Royal, that is. That game is perfection incarnate, and I thought this game couldn't get any better. Oh, how wrong I was. This game was a 10 out of 10, and <laughs> still is, but Royal is just in a different league. The next decade is filled with games, from Persona 5 Royal, to Final Fantasy 7 Remake, to Animal Crossing, to The Last of Us Part 2, to Watch Dogs Legion, to Cyberpunk 2077, to Marvel's Avengers, to the Xbox Series X, it was a terrible name, it should have been named Scarlet, to the PS5, and that's all just next year. The next decade is going to be a wonderful time for the industry. I maintain that 2020 is going to be one of the most defining years for gaming. Not just from the consoles that come out, which will change up the industry a lot, but the games are going to be some of the most impactful games we've ever seen. I'm convinced of this. And with that, it's time to end. Thank you so much for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like, subscribe, share the video around. I also have a Twitch, a Twitter and a Patreon if you'd like to support me and the channel. Tell me, what was your favourite game of the decade? You now know mine, Persona 5 is a masterpiece and I can't wait for you all to experience Persona 5 Royal next year. It is so worth getting, as is all the other games I've listed, and that's not mentioning other games that have been announced. There's so many indies like No Straight Roads, Chris Tales, Ari and the Secret of Seasons, Man Eater, and yeah, and that just names a few. There's so many games, and yeah, I can't wait for 2020. It is going to be an awesome experience, and yeah, I know I'm just gonna have a blast playing the games for you and experiencing them, and yeah. So, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye bye.